So uh, Virginia and I are very good friends, and I work a lot with Virginia. And this is the second time I've actually had the, the pleasure of interviewing her, which is, is really fun because it... I just love Virginia, and I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to work with her. Um, Virginia has a great, long, wonderful bio, and I'll kind of maybe hit on a couple of the highlights, and then the first thing I think I'll talk about, though, is today Virginia was on the front page of the Washington Post food section, and that's just huge. Isn't it exciting? Not only was she on the front page, but she was on a whole other page and the whole back page. So that was just a really, that was a really fun thing for me to, to see, and I, and I pulled it up this morning, and it was, it was just wonderful to, to get to read that, and I, you know, of course I emailed it to my mom, and, you know, that was, that was very fun. So she, if, you, if you happen to go to WashingtonPost.com, you can read a whole lovely interview about her. Um, Virginia is, she grew up kind of in... A little bit in Louisiana, a lot in Georgia, moved around a little bit, definitely has southern roots. Um, she went to cooking school up in Maryland mm -hmm. at L'Academy um, de, Cuisine, de Cuisine. I can't, I'm not, I don't speak French, so you have to pardon any, any pronunciations that I have in here. It's just an embarrassment. I can read it. I can't, it can't come out my mouth right because I just, it just doesn't work. Um, and... She moved to France, worked with, with Anne Willen, who is in the same realm as Julia Child. She's actually worked with Julia Child as well. Uh, she spent a, three months that turned into three years in France and loved that. And I think writing a book was always in the back of her mind. Uh, she had a great career up in New York working with Epicurious.com. She was one of the first people that ever worked with Bobby Flay. She worked um, with, with Martha Stewart for a very long time. And that kind of is always something that I like to get out of the way first, is having that conversation. It was pre-incarceration. Um, yeah, we had, to, we had to, you know, tip a hat to her on, on election day when she couldn't go to the polls. Um, you've been everywhere. You've done a lot. She's... She got to do a lot of world travel with Epicurious when she worked with Epicurious. And she's, you know, picked the lemons in, I don't know. Amalfi. Amalfi. I, I was like, I can't even remember where the lemons are from. And she, she fished on the fishing boat for sardines in wherever that is. Sicily. And she's raked the salt in... France. France. <laughs> <laughs> so she's got... Oh, and you did this... You did the snails, and I actually got to go to the snail farm with her in France after the fact. But she's done all of these incredible things, and, and, and it's just like second nature for her to get to. And she doesn't, it, it's never, oh, I've been there, done that. It's just matter of fact that she gets to, oh, I was, these lemons, and they were beautiful in Amalfi. <laughs> you know, these famous lemons or whatever. So, again, let's kind of get the, get the big stuff out of the way. Let's get the Martha thing out of the way. What was that like? What did you do? What was your job? That was a really incredible uh, opportunity for me to work for Martha Stewart. I, I'd been living and working in France, and the short version is, is that um, I was supposed to be in France for three months, and I was there for three years. And someone asked me recently, did I fall in love? Meaning, did I fall in love with a, with a man or a person? And I said, well, no, I fell in love with France. And that's what made me stay. Before I left France, I was sort of was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next uh, when I came back stateside. And I wanted to work for Martha Stewart uh, because she's Martha Stewart. And I'm, I'm very goal-oriented, and I uh, started trying to figure out the way in, the way in, the way in. And um, eventually what happened was that Natalie Dupree, who I started my career with who, as an apprentice, who's from Atlanta, she sat next to Susan Spungen, who was the food editor at the time, and um, said to Susan, I know someone that needs to work for you. And so uh, Susan got me in the door. And I was the kitchen director 
for her television series, and it was right when it was going from uh, weekly to daily, and shortly, very quickly, it went from a 30-minute show to a one-hour show. Um, and being kitchen, kitchen director for Martha Stewart essentially means that I was responsible for all the food on the television show. Everything from making sure that there's the bowl of salt to there's the beautiful cake. And the beautiful the peaches in the middle of December. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that was one of the things that was sort of interesting because as kitchen director, I was actually responsible for grocery shopping, which you might think that that would be like a like low on the totem pole kind of thing. But it wasn't because everything had to be so beautiful and so perfect. So many times I found myself at the Union Square Farmer's Market in the middle of Manhattan at 6 o'clock in the morning with all the chefs, you know, uh, restaurant chefs going through a case of pears to find, you know, six pears with stem and leaves attached. Um, it, was, it, it was incredible. I got to work with a lot of really great people. Uh, the one thing about Martha that she's very clear on, and I, I don't hesitate in saying this, is when I mean, she does have this reputation for perfection, which is very much warranted. Um, but she basically sort of tells you from the get-go um, if you're not A-plus 100%, please leave. <laughs> so it was, a, it, was, it was incredible. It was an incredible opportunity. Well, it was, a, it was a great training ground for you because I know that I've, I've worked for you with a television show. When Virginia moved back to Atlanta, she, again, wanted to go into the television production side of things, and she kept on and kept on and kept on trying to find the right person, the right person, the right person to, to be able to get involved with the television show that was produced here in Atlanta. And she ended up being the producer for Home Plate on Turner South Network when Turner South Network was around. And she was the producer for Home Plate for Marvin Woods for, for yeah, three remember, years. Yeah, he was a really cute Amer African-American guy with a bandana. So, uh, with the do-rag, yeah. yeah. So, Virginia was the producer on that show, and then I was her assistant and so I kind of learned exactly how to do things exactly right. And then again, Natalie was a great, Natalie, if you all remember Natalie Dupree, she has probably the, the one of the top ten people that has had television shows on public, um, public broadcasting. She has 20-something books to her credit, and Virginia worked with her for, for quite a while. And Natalie is the kind of person that will walk up to somebody and say, you need to hire this person, or you need to know her. And she's a great springboard for a lot of people's careers. So she takes, she takes good care of people when, when you work with her. Um, so speaking of TV shows, the rumor circulating that <laughs> you've been talking about it or somebody's been talking to you about it. Is that kind of thinking in the future? Yes. Um, the, the, my book has been very successful. I, I found out last week that I've sold them my advance, which means I've Sold, essentially, I sold 25,000 books in six months. Wow. <laughs> Which is huge in the, in the book business, in the cookbook business. Well, yeah, for a cookbook, definitely. And then, you know, we all have to remember that, you know, Rachel Ray can, like, blink her eyelash and she sells 25,000 books. This is a really different uh, thing. But there are several production companies that are talking to me and are interested in me. And I flew to L.A. a couple months ago and met with some people. Um, I think that what I'm waiting for and what I'm hoping that will happen, um, not to, to, to go too far off course, but when I, when I wanted to write this book and I needed to write my proposal, and I, I wrote my proposal, and it took me a while to get it done, and then finally started working on it. And I wanted it to be this certain thing. So I hired uh, a mutual friend, colleague, to help me edit it. She used to be a teacher. She's a food person. She assists at Cook's Warehouse. And she and her husband used to own a publishing company. So I hired her to be my editor for my proposal before I sent my proposal to my agent. All right, well, the woman that I wanted for my agent, I was very specific about who I wanted, and that was Plan A. So I thought I'll have Plan A, and if that doesn't work out, then I'll go to plan B. Well, plan A worked. So when I needed to turn in my uh, manuscript, I hired the same person that had helped me with my proposal to help me with my manuscript. 
because I wanted to turn in a manuscript that was as equally high quality as my proposal. Even though I was going to have an editor at the publishing company, even though I was going to have people at the publishing company looking at the manuscript, copy editors, all that kind of stuff. So how that relates to tell, oh wait, and then, this is the, this is the kind of the kicker, the funny thing. I had this conversation with my agent and I said, I want a hard fat book, I want, you know, 200 recipes, I want it all color, and I want photography. And I, I have to make a certain amount of money, or I, it doesn't make any sense. And she kind of giggled and said, well, everybody wants that. Because <laughs> everybody does want that. And I said, I understand that, but if I can't, if I don't, if I can't get that, then I don't need that. Like, I don't want it. If I can't get these things that I want, then I don't want. So, segging back to television, I have a company in Massachusetts that's interested. They actually have offices in L.A. and in Massachusetts, but they're interested. They were interested in doing a pilot for me, which is essentially someone like giving you hundred thousand um, dollars. Now, this is a big L.A. production company. They have hundred thousand dollars in the change of their sofa, and and it's a tax write off for them. You know, and it's all. A, looking at it from a business perspective. But what they wanted me to do was not what I wanted to do. And I didn't really ever keep, wrap my head around the Bon Appetit, y'all, Massachusetts part. <laughs> you know. So I declined. And I feel like that in life you have to, you have to make, say no sometimes to good things so that you can say yes to great things. And as it always is, you're true to yourself and you're true to your goals. And I think that's one thing about Virginia is she does set goals and she sets her goals very high and she sets her standards very high. And it all relates back to what she's done and how she's developed in her career and what she's done to get where she is. And I think that's extremely respectable. How many people do you know that don't just sign on the dotted line and they end up They end up, you know, in a commercial somehow for Burger King. Not that there's anything wrong with Burger King. No. Um, you know, they end up in a commercial for Burger King because they, they, it, the the big picture was you're going to be a Food Network star, whatever it was, and yeah. they they don't yes. read the fine print, and it's and it and it really in this in this business in this age of food television, that's the way it goes sometimes, and and you don't see you see a lot of the new ones on there that end up doing that kind of thing, but the, the more established people... To people that aren't on there anymore. That, that know better, you know, they know better. They know to read the fine, the fine print. Mm -hmm. And you've, Virginia's recently taped one or two segments with Paula Dean, and she's mm -hmm. been asked back to be with Paula Dean again. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, oh, my God, it was so much fun. Martha... Paula. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really great. No, I, actually, it's funny because I worked last summer with Paula Dean after we finished the shoot for my book. Gina was the kitchen manager for the shoot and was the only reason I was able to complete it. And I'd worked like nine days in a row and I get this phone call during the middle of the shoot. Paula Dean wants me to come down there and tape uh, to, to do some food styling. And I thought, oh gosh, okay, well, I can't say no because we don't know what will happen. So then I go down there for two days, and I only took place for one day, you know, one, you know, and um, so one out that afternoon, her assistant comes to me and says, "Ladies, some journalist coming tomorrow to shoot Thanksgiving cover story." <laughs> they thought we had a food stylist and chef. We thought they had a food, you know, each thought the other had, neither had. So he said, can you stay? <laughs> so I went to Target and bought some clothes. <laughs> so I could show up the next day not in, like, you know, a dirty apron. Not only to say, I guess it must have been a super Target, because I'm sure she had to get the turkey yeah, and the yeah. I, cook Thanksgiving dinner on the fly. In July. In July. It's not so easy. For a shoot tomorrow and pull out some cranberries and everything else. In the in the production world, it's it's you shoot in July for November, right. December, so. So, but what happened was I stayed and we had a great time, and then 
one of my philosophies is just to, you know, you don't know who you're going to meet and how many interesting people you're going to greet and what kind of experiences can come to you. And I'm not just talking about, like, a career sort of thing. I'm just talking about ex exposing yourself and your, and your philosophy to, to other people and getting to get other people's input and other people's philosophy. And I just think it's really important. And, of course, when, it's difficult when you're younger, but, you know, when you get a little bit older and there's a little bit more confidence, it's, it's easier. So, having said that, this summer, Ladies Home Journal featured my book as one of their favorite books because the shoot went well. And then Paula Dean asked me to come tape with her last month. Um, and she's featuring me in May in her magazine. Um, we went down and taped, and the whole setup was that how different Paula and I are. Because I grew up in Montezuma, Georgia, which is only like an hour, or hour, hour and a half north of Albany, where she's from. And at one point, she said, well, first of all, wait, Paula is exactly what you see. There is no pretense. And without, you know, going into it, there are other television personalities that I've worked with before they're not exactly what you see on television. <laughs> so, but Paula is, hey, y'all, and, you know, she, we tape in her house, and she'd come down with bedhead and raccoon eyes, and, <laughs> hey, y'all, and uh, so anyway, so this past, last month, when I went down, her mother's month, six weeks ago, so we tape, and they're promoting, they're, the, the whole point of the show is to show the differences, to really, really play up the differences that I'm a trained chef and lived and worked in France and I chop fast and my recipes are what might be perceived as a little bit more sophisticated and um, and she's basically a home cook and uh, but she was really wonderful and really sweet. Virginia makes time. her own mayonnaise. <laughs> Paula Dean uses a lot of mayonnaise. Well, she doesn't necessarily make her own. Well it was really funny because we had such a great time but when it, I did two recipes and she did two recipes and my recipes were um, a fresh ham with fresh herbe de Provence. Like a, instead of the dried herbe de Provence that one can buy in the store. You know, fresh savory, fresh lavender, fresh rosemary. Um, and an Erica Vera, which is little skinny green beans, Provencal. So with tomatoes and onion and garlic. And her recipes, one of them was a, like a savory monkey bread. That you take uh, canned biscuits <laughs> and you roll them into a ball and you dip them in butter, butter. <laughs> and then you roll them in um, sugar. No, no, no sugar. Savory uh, oh. cheese with Italian seasoning, dried Italian seasoning, and put them in a bun pan. And I'm like, and first one of the things that happened was that I went to go crack the biscuit on the counter. I can't tell you the last time I cracked up in a can of biscuits. I can't. And it exploded and scared the mess out of me. And I screamed. I actually thought that was really funny. And then she's like, you know, dipping the butter, and I'm helping her. And she's like dipping her hands in the butter, and she starts licking her hands. <laughs> no, it gets worse. I don't know if it's gonna, I don't know if it's going to make it to the final cut or not. It was really sweet, but she's licking the butter, and then she, like, dips her hands Here in the butter. Here you go, some dough. And, and tries to get me to lick the butter off her fingers. Oh, no. I just threw my head back. I'm like, I don't know you. <laughs> I mean, y'all, if you think about it, there's a really short list of people that I would lick butter off their fingers. <laughs> um, like families, lovers, you know, th you know, things like that. But uh, uh, anyway, but we had a good time, and then... Uh, one of the last things that, that happened was uh, one of my favorite smells in the whole entire world is when you invert a cake uh. and you lift open, the, you lift up that cake pan and you have that brown butter scent. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if it's lined with wax paper. When I was a little girl, my grandmother would let me chew on the wax paper. Did anyone do that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, we couldn't swallow it, but you could chew it all the butter goodness out of it. Well, her, her grip, she'd just chew it and eat it. <laughs> and she told me that. And I said, and I said, you're a goat. And she said, I am a goat. And then we both realized that we were both goats. We're both Capricorns. And so that was this whole, like, you know, whole, like, you know, shared birthday love fest about Christmas birthdays. Um, 
but she was really sweet. She was really sweet. We had a great, great time. <laughs> All right. Moving on. I don't know how to segue from that to my next my next question. Um, okay, fast forward. Uh-huh. Or backpedal, maybe. When did you know you had to write Bond T, y'all? I mean, has it always just been the thing? Um, frankly, the, the germ of this book happened uh, at the Food Writers Conference with the Greenbrier. You know, the Greenbrier is this resort like Eisenhower and Hallucinogenics in Western Virginia, the big core. And there's a food writers conference there every year, which is a really small conference. It's like 100 people, uh, incredible speakers, incredible participants. And I think it was probably, honestly, 1996 that that took root. I had Ann Willen, the woman that Gina mentioned before, she is a very active participant in this and, and has La Verena at the Greenbrier. And, um, and so it occurred to me, I, I know I don't, it wasn't as far ago as 96, I think it was like two, uh, 97 or two, 98, but it, it, it occurred to me then that this is something that I wanted to do, that I wanted to write a story about the three generations of my family. And I wanted to record the recipes from my grandmother, the really old-fashioned Southern recipes, the recipes from my mother that that I learned growing up when li- living in Louisiana, and then my own recipes. But many things sort of prevented it from happening. One of which is that I was working, you know, been working for other people, and couldn't didn't have the time couldn't have the time to do it. But it really. It, it started then, in the late 90s, and it took a while because of different things, but I, I, I know now in retrospect um, that not only was my food not grown up enough, but my writing wasn't grown up enough. Um, and so I, I think it happened at the right time. Okay, so two Greenbrier stories. This is what I love because I've, I've known Virginia for a long time, so I can now segue into two Greenbrier stories. One Greenbrier story, Julia Child. Oh. Uh, so I worked for Ann Willen. I don't know. Um, she had a cold de cuisine La Varenne originally in Paris and then later in Burgundy, France. And one of the reasons I stayed for three years instead of three months is that La Varenne was located in a... Um, 17th century French chateau overlooking 20 miles of countryside. Unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. Um, so this was in the, the mid-90s, and I was living and working in France for Anne. And then when she would come stateside, I would come stateside too. So I was living in D.C. She was based out of D.C. Uh, I guess I was like 27. Anyway, so I go to meet Anne. I drive over from D.C. to uh, meet Anne at the Great Briar. And I'm staying with her in her cottage. She's not in the hotel proper. She's in one of the cottages. So I get there, and I'm really, you know, tired. It's snowed on the way over. Um, I get to the cottage, and... and It's in the middle of nowhere. Let me just start with that. And she and her husband aren't in the cottage. I realize that they're at dinner. So I, frankly, am kind of excited, because that means I can just go to bed. I don't have any more work obligations. So I get my... PJs and go to bed, and a little bit later, she's English. She's a nationalized American citizen living in France, but she's English. She's Terribly. Just, yeah, very. Like, she literally will stand like this. I'm like, very, you know, um, Virginia. Oh, I'm like, yes, ma'am. She's, I'd like to have a meeting. So <laughs> I get dressed, and I get outside, and we have our meeting. We talk about the recipes I tested that week, and da 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 da. And she's starting to hem and haw. And she's She's not him or Howard type person. And I have a favor to ask of you. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, uh, Stephanie, yeah, I won't continue the accent because I'm not very good at it, but she said, um, Stephanie has had to leave for the week. I was wondering if you would mind staying with Julia. So Stephanie was Julia's assistant. And I had met Julia several times because Julia would come over to the Chateau in France and stay for several weeks at a time. But so 
So essentially, I shared a suite with Julia Child for the week. Um, just carrying her book bag and making sure she didn't forget her cane. And, um, would you, you know, mind? When, when she said, would you mind? You know, of course, I just wanted to, I wanted to cartwheel down that darn mountain. Um, I was so happy. But the great thing is about that was the next morning, because I was trying to be cool, as cool as I could be <laughs> about it. And the next morning, I found this little niche. And I called my mother and my grandmother. And I, I'm staying with Julia Child. <laughs> I can't hear you. I'm staying with Julia Child. So finally on the fourth, fifth time, they heard me. And they were so excited. Because my mother and my grandmother used to watch Julia Child on television. And my mother would cook all these recipes. It was just such a great thing. Well, I guess it was two years ago. I was actually asked to be a speaker at the Greenbrier. That was my second years. thing. Yeah. It all came around. So it was really beautiful because I was sitting in that little niche. I, I was sitting down in a little niche, and I realized I realized I was sitting in that same that niche where I had called my mom and my grandmother, you know, 10 years ago. And it just was this amazing, just incredible, you know, boo-hoo experience. Full circle. <laughs> it was way full. It's very full circle, yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. I'm glad that we... We got there because that's not in my little scripted thing. So that's very good. That's a very powerful um, moment for me. Another great moment, which I remember because I got a phone call that day. You got a big thumbs up from Publishers Weekly before your book hit the shelves. That's That was the first, I think that was the book getting, getting, getting the agent, the book getting accepted, moving forward, the book's getting done. And then the book is coming out soon, and all of a sudden, Publishers Weekly, which is? They, they review, I mean, they, it's a Publishers Weekly, so there are 52 editions, but they don't, they don't review a, a cookbook every week. Um, they review, you know, probably 25 cookbooks a year. Um, so to be mentioned by, it's an industry publication, obviously, but, but to be mentioned by Publishers Weekly is a, is a big star. Um, and they wrote a incredibly nice review uh, that I don't know verbatim, but the, the, the short version is, is that, you know, this should, this will be a classic. So it was a bit intimidating, quite frankly, to be labeled a classic before it even come out. Um, but also I, it was, uh, it was uh, validating and encouraging and uh, very exciting. Yeah, it was. yeah. That was great. I always called it. <laughs> um, Book gets published. You have your release party, which was great and huge. You start on book tour. Tell us about book tour. <laughs> you hear about book tour. People, y'all have been to see authors. If this is Tuesday, this must be Belgium. I mean, yeah, it's very much that. That's very much that. Um, you know, I mean, I live here in Atlanta, so it was lovely. It's lovely. I'm ten minutes from home, but yeah. I do events like this all over, and I've been. I've been to California and Texas and Chicago, Massachusetts, Connecticut, all over the Carolinas, um, Tennessee. It's, it's a lot of travel. And some of you know, honestly, there was one day when I was traveling in Texas that due to a series of most unfortunate events, I was in seven airports in one day. That pretty much almost, like, don't push me over the edge. I finally, you know, when you see a line forming at the airport and you don't know what it's about, but you just feel compelled to get in it. <laughs> I got in line, and I didn't even know what was happening, and I called Marriott, and I said, I need a room. Um, but it's been incredible because I've, I'm a member of different professional organizations. So one of the things that I try to do is to reach out to those organizations to meet people that I haven't met, to put faces to emails that I've, you know, corresponded with. And it's really been amazing. I've met so many incredible people. Um, I've, I make it a point to really try to find out what the real local place is, the real local restaurant, what really is the local specialty, um, that the best barbecue is really at the back of this gas station. Um, 
you know, that kind of thing. And as a food person, that just completely gets me charged to, to be able to travel to all these different cities and to really find out. You know, and I'll admit it, I'm not going to lie, there's some nights that it's hotel room service, you know, but that's okay too. But it really, it's really been amazing. And, and the wonderful thing in terms of the success of the book tour is that basically everywhere I went in the beginning, they've all asked me back. And I, I teach a lot of classes, and I love to teach. I mean, I love to talk, but I really love to cook and teach and teach people how to cook. She can talk and cook at the same time, which is not easy. A lot of people can't do it. Um, but book tour is not all you do. Mm. Like today. Mm. Tell us about your day to day. This is a typical day. <laughs> Deep breath. Um, well, first let me preface it by my computer died on Friday. Oh, yeah. So that sort of puts that patina on the, all of my life. But it'll, it's all going to be better. This morning I had a photo shoot for the AJC, and we shot four, I tested and developed and edited four recipes for the Saving Seven Recipes Project, which is a, what I'm very much a part of, which I love. I encourage y'all to check out. Um, I had a lot of communication about the Washington Post article, which was very exciting. I had an online chat for the Washington Post at one or two. I can't remember. We were trying to figure out one. Whatever. Was one. it one? <laughs> What? Okay. And then um, and then I cook the grits that y'all are going to hopefully taste after our talk. In our spare um, time. This <laughs> afternoon. And I uh, fed the chickens and uh, <laughs> we have chickens, so that was on my Chicks list. in the city. That was, exactly. a, that was on my list of household chores to do. And there's copious amounts of dishes, of course, but that's my day. Exactly. And that's your day almost every day. Well, it's really exciting because it's different every yeah. day. Um, tomorrow, I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching a class. Um, you know, I have an article due. Uh, it, it's it's something a little different every day, which is really exciting. It's a lot to juggle sometimes, frankly, but it's really it's awesome. You mentioned that you're a, a in, involved in a lot of different organizations and things. I, I'll put a plug in here. You're the President of the Ladams Escoffier group. Tell us a little bit about that group. Oh, I love it. Ladams Escoffier is a group of women um, in the culinary industry, and sometimes I get in trouble when I say this, but I usually say it anyway. It's sort of half mafia, half sorority. It's a little bit of both. Um, but it's the chap. It's chapters internationally. There's a, a, almost 20 chapters in the states and, and abroad, and it's women of achievement. It's an invitation only society. Um, we do incredible work. Our chapter in Atlanta last year, as a result of our major fundraiser, which is uh, Afternoon in the Country at Serenby, we were able to give $20,000 to Georgia Organics and $20,000 in scholarships to women in the culinary industry. Right? Exactly. This is a volunteer organization. So I was, it was a huge honor to be elected president, and I love love, love LaDoms. Um, so I was, I was president this year, which I do question my sanity on having a book tour and being president at the same time, but, you know, when they go and get stuff, you just go. So, uh, but it's, it's been amazing, and it's, that's one of the groups that I reach out to when I'm traveling. I'll be in Dallas, and I'm like, hey, y'all, coming to Dallas. And, and everyone's just really supportive. It's like, there'll be everything from, okay, let's have lunch, to... Let's, let's have a book signing. Let's host an event. Let's host an you. event. So, yeah. yeah. That's very good. Gina is a past president of LaDoms, just as a matter of fact. just had to give it a little yeah. way before, way past. Okay. I know you're an avid New York Times. She, she's an avid reader, an avid public radio listener, and she always is calling me up. Did you read this in the Times, or did you, did you, are you listening to NPR right now? And I, I'm... <laughs> You know, the stock answer is, well, no, I can turn it on. What, what? <laughs> the chicken show that time was very interesting that yeah. I did turn on. But in Sunday Style section in the New York Times, um, there was an interesting piece on how the economic downturn is affecting restaurants. And even more importantly, the way we um, view spending money and entertaining 
et cetera. The bottom line, luxury is out, glitz is over, sensibility is in. Do you think this is affecting your book sales, and do you see more people wanting to learn to cook at home or cooking at home? I know it's kind of short term for that, but... No, no, no. Yes, I agree. There are a couple of different things. First of all, I think that definitely less people are going out to eat. Um, any restaurateur can tell you that. Um, people are going out, going out less to eat, especially for special occasions. Um, having said that, I think that more people are cooking at home. And, frankly, there are a lot of resources that are, that are essentially free on the Internet uh, so the publishing companies, publishing companies are quaking too, uh, especially for cookbooks. But uh, all across the board, all across um, sort of all genres of literature, nonfiction, fiction, etc., um, advances. No one knows what to think. So what I'm hoping is that because I wanted my book to be more than just simply a cookbook, and that there are stories there as well. It's not just, you know, a cup of flour, a cup of sugar, two eggs, da 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 how to cook a cake or how to cook a biscuit, and that there are stories as well that that, that may have more appeal than just a, a pure recipe that you get off Epicurious.com or Gourmet.com or MarthaStewart.com or any of that. So, segueing into this question... You've learned a lot about internet marketing, blogs, online media, etc. What do you what do you participate in? I know you have a great newsletter that you send out. I know you do a lot of links to a lot of different things. How do you see that as part of your part of your branding, I guess? Well, no, I think it's important. I think that one thing that applies to all levels of business. Um, especially if it's a small business or a small company or an individually owned business, um, that branding is important. However, if we, and one of the things that my business, my company does is I do teach media training. And Gina and I actually have done media training together. I think the caution is, is that if you did everything that's out there, Twitter and Facebook and, you know, all the different social networking sites, if you actually did all that, one would never work. You would never actually be working. If you're, it's, if you're so tuned in, you're actually tuned out. So there's got to be a balance of that. Um, I have a newsletter, and y'all are welcome to sign up for it. I don't do anything nasty like sell your name or email you insistently. Um, but you can sign up on my website, which is virginiawills.com. But I get excited. What I like to do is I, I get excited about things that I'm able to do or see, or I'll talk about the restaurants in Dallas that I ate at, or I'll talk about the barbecue in the back of the gas station in Kansas City. And, you know, if they're, the newsletter is now national, they're, but there are definitely more people in the southeast. Um, and then I'll include a bit of seasonal information, like I may talk about good pots and pans because we're coming up and braising and stewing this season. And I'd say... This is really great. It's really expensive, or you can get this at the hardware store. Like it's not, it's not advertorial. And I'll include a seasonal recipe, and I enjoy that. I think it's, um, I think it is important. I mean, essentially, I'm, I'm well, I, even though I'm a cookbook author, I am a small business. So we have to look at that, and you have to look at as, as other small business owners, whether you're a, a coffee shop or a coffee shop. One, as a business person, has to look at different ways of getting information in front of a client or potential customer. Um, all right, now it's just some chatty chat chat. Okay. What's your, what, what came out of the oven that you said, I can't believe I made this? Look how, I can't believe I actually made this. I mean, the first time I made hollandaise was... I can't believe I made it. I can't believe it worked. What was the, what, what's the, I can't believe I did this, this is so cool type thing for you? I think I would have to go back to working with Anne. Anne was in, in France, is really, like, she's like the queen of souffles. She could look at a teacup and tell you how many egg whites it would take and, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, because I was there, 
and I guess I have. I have a penchant for crazy women, like a moth to a flame, and I have, a, I think, a penchant for punishment sometimes, but I decided that it was going to be my goal to learn how to make a souffle from Anne. So every week, with the leftover bits of cheese from the cheese platter, I would make a cheese souffle, and many times it would come out like this, or like this, or like that, or, and, and you know, every week, it was this painful beratement of what I had done wrong and what I had done right, but there was a lot more wrong than right. And the first time I pulled out, like, the proper top hat souffle, you know, from this woman that I respected, from this chef, from this cookbook author that I respected so much, that was a really hugely special moment. Um, that, that was very, very much a, oh, my God, I can't believe I finally did it. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> All right. Turn the pot over. What was just the worst, <laughs> the worst thing? I made a, I made a, um, I made, let's remember, like, a bunch of years ago, those flourless chocolate cakes. Were, I mean, now you can get them, like, at Duncan Hines off the shelf. But I tried to make a flourless chocolate cake for my girlfriend's birthday. And it was so flourless that I had truly forgot the flour and had a dinner party for, I think, ten people. And I pulled the cakes out of the oven. It was just a puddle. I don't remember how I... I think I poured more wine. <laughs> how do you think? I think my punt was more wine. It wasn't even like... Wasn't, like, it, wasn't even like putting it in a custard cup and starting it with a spoon as a... Well, now I would know better because it's like, that was probably like 12 years ago. Now I'd be like, oh, look, warm chocolate sauce. Y'all here. Do some strawberries in it. See, that's the thing. This is one thing that Natalie always used to say. Um, when people go on the golf course and they, like, lose four balls or they, uh, you know, take some ten putts on the green or, you know, whatever, no one tells anyone about that. But somehow you burn a tray of biscuits before your guests come over and you feel compelled to tell them that you burned the biscuits and had to throw them away. Well, why bother? Don't tell them. So, you know, I mean, I think half the part of, like, being in a professional kitchen is if something goes wrong, you got to fix it. Otherwise, you just may as well just, like, throw that money down the drain. And how fast can we whip another yeah. batch, batch of, the first batch might have taken 45 minutes, but that second batch of biscuits yeah. can take 10. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so much quicker the second time around when you yeah. burn something or it, yeah. something's wrong with it. It's, you can just whip it up really quick the next I'm time. Sure. Um. What do you see, in it, being, in, being in Atlanta, what do you see um, kind of happening in the culinary scene in Atlanta? Is it, are we moving in the right direction here? I think so. I think it's so exciting that we have so many chef, we're increasing with our chef-driven restaurants. There aren't as many sort of Maggiano, I mean, I'm not being, trying to be, I'm not being snotty and disparaging, but there are more chef-driven restaurants where there's actually a person it cares, and it's their livelihood, and it's how they pay their mortgage, and it's how they feed their family. And they care. And they have a relationship with the farmer. And they have a relationship with the person who's raising those chickens. Or driving all the way to Alabama to uh, harvest the chickens, because we don't have a USDA processing plant in Georgia for small, for small groups. Um, there's also on a level, on a different level, it's, it's not quite the same, but there are a lot of, you know, more quote-unquote celebrity chefs coming into town. Kraft is open. John George, Kraft, with um, John George is open, Spice. We're getting some really big name celebrity chefs with outpost here. Um, I, I think that, uh, in general, that, uh, the, the food in Atlanta is awesome, and you know, the thing is, is that, and this is something that I think that why food is so important in the South, is that it's such an incredible growing season. Ten months, easy. Yeah. You know, we've got food, fresh, local, regional food, ten months out of the year. So, so speaking of which, what do you think is, and, and season, seasonally, I guess, is, is in, but what do you see as like the, the things that we see right now that we'll be seeing a lot more of in the near future. What's hot? 
I think that will increase. I think that the part about uh, the regional is going to improve. If nothing more, I mean, frankly, Walmart is promoting buying regionally. Now, they're not doing it out of some auspices of good. They're doing it because the gas, <coughs> you know, the, the, the gas, I mean, um, it is, well, now it's less expensive, but if you multiply the fleet, the number in their fleet. But I think that we will be seeing less um, international foods, perhaps. It just tastes better. I mean, at the end of the day, it really does taste better. And I have a satisfaction, me personally, you grew up in St. Simons. I have a satisfaction that I know when I buy wild American shrimp, it's entirely possible that my friend Gina Berry has had a beer with that shrimper. Or that, no, I'm not. Or that those blueberries come from Neil, who I see once a month at the farmer's market. It's not only that you're supporting your, you're supporting your local economy. You're supporting your neighbors. You're supporting your neighbor. Yeah. You're helping your neighbor. You're helping your neighbor like pay their mortgage, pay their car payment. You know whatever. It's just all. It's just it's just a, food is such a sense of community, and I think that that is where I see the love and the joy, and and there's also a practical aspect. Yeah. Virginia, Virginia jokes. I've probably had a beer with everybody in the whole state of Georgia. I, I'm a I'm a, I'm a beer drinker at heart. <laughs> My mother would like to, like to not a, hear that. <laughs> she, she, see, you didn't have to say all that far. I know, exactly. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from St. Simons, and I'm very proud of, of being from St. Simons, and I have a thing for shrimp. And there's a, there's a nice little blurb in Virginia's book about the differences between Virginia serving shrimp with the tail on and me saying there's oh no place for the Gina tail. Came Gina came over one day to, I was having a party and she asked me if I could help. I'm like, yeah, peel the shrimp for me, please. Um, but leave the tail on. And those eyebrows just like went up perilously high because she's like, no one except non-coastal people leave the tail on. You know, it's like, what do you want? The, stick your fingers in the food. And have to <laughs> fish the tail. We still have this conversation to this day. <laughs> it's like, why do you why do people make gumbo with the shrimp with the tails on? Don't you know better? You don't want to stick your fingers in that <laughs> food and have to get the tails off. Shrimp cocktail, maybe. Maybe. But don't be frying the shrimp with the tail. You know, whatever. <laughs> we'll argue about that till we're old. We will argue about that till we're old. And thank goodness we'll have something to argue and laugh about. Um, all right. Before I... Can you hand us a book, please? Thank you. Um, so right before we get into some questions or whatever, which we will, we will get into that because Virginia is a great question answer. Um, what do you see as, we, we know what's on the way in, what's on the way out? What do you, what do you think is on the way out? Mm. Flourless okay. chocolate cake? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the thing is is that it just takes so long for something to be out. Because yeah. It starts at the it starts at the chef level. Then it'll, you know, sort of trickle down to the fast food restaurant level. Fast level and then the fast food level. And then now truly I think that you can buy You can buy them at Costco, I saw them yesterday. Flourless chocolate cakes. Ready to go. Ready to go. They have them in the refrigerated section. Flour right. four, four flourless chocolate cakes. In and you have to take into consideration that this is something that Jean George von der Rutten started 15 years ago. Yeah. Okay. And there are some restaurants that, regardless of how much their pastry chef hates making it, she or he has to because there's the demand. Um, what's going out? Curly. Curly. Oh. There's a. I made. I that made, makes me sad. I made creme brulee last weekend, and I, I bad cook, creme brulee would be good to go away. Yeah. Okay. I cook a, I cook, a, I cook. I don't really bake a lot, and I was um, up cooking. Virginia was up cooking in Highlands last weekend, and I just happened to be in Highlands cooking. She was cooking for a big, fancy restaurant event, and I was cooking, you know, for a family of four or whatever. But uh, I was, I cook. I don't necessarily follow recipes, so I had taken all my food and I had everything I needed. And I had my little ramekins for my creme brulee, and I didn't bring a recipe, and I thought, I can't just whip out 
whip out a, a creme brulee. I don't know the proportions. I don't know the right proportions. So I just so I just happened in my car. I always happen to have stuff in my car. Happened to have a book, and so I pulled out your creme brulee <laughs> recipe out of my book, and I I, I prepared okay, that. We're not kidding. Like earlier, before Gina and I, before y'all got here, I literally called Gina. I said, I forgot my pot at home. Do you have one in the car? <laughs> I wish I did. Which I did not, because I just literally took it out today because I had to buy some food for a project, and I literally just unloaded all my pots and pans out of my car. But I have. It's ridiculous the things that I can you know, produce out of the trunk of my car. I was in a restaurant eating, and uh, something, I went back to say hello to the, that's another thing, I went back to say hello to the chef or whatever, and there was a big brouhaha going on in the kitchen because they didn't have any propane for their creme brulees, to, to torch their creme brulees, and I was like, oh, I've got one in the car, do you want it, you want to maybe you want to borrow it? He still owes me that, yeah. that propane tank, I, maybe I'll go in and he'll, you know, send me a dessert or something. But I thought it would be appropriate to end with an excerpt from your book. Maybe read the... Thank you. Um, so, so like I said earlier, what I really wanted... One of the things that I really wanted to try to do, and this has been sort of a persistent quote, I, 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 I'm not pretending that this is great literature. Um, I will say that when I wrote the proposal um, that I did include in it that the, the aspiration to be like Pat Conroy's cookbook, which of course I think is an incredible author. And uh, I really wanted this book to be more than oregano is an herb that grows in the Mediterranean. Womp, 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 womp. Um, there are lots of books like that. So this is recipes and stories with three generations. So it's the recipes for my grandmother, the recipes for my mother, and my own recipes. Um, before I start, this here and you can see it closer outside. Um, this is the inside of my grandmother's cupboard where she worked and chopped and stirred and spooned and such. And if you open that cupboard, it, the plates were there. I mean, it's, and it's, but this is where her, she held her recipes. And she started just taping them to the inside of the cupboard and then, you know, eventually just started writing on the wood. <laughs> and my mother lives there now. My grandmother's been passed away for about 10 years. But my mother lives in our home, that, our family home now. And it's still there. Like all of them are still there. My mom has tacked up a couple new ones. Um, but mainly it's my grandmother's. Because they're the recipes that we always use. And uh, that, it's like a, it's a totem to me, you know. Um, so, while she's flipping, I will say that there was conversation last week when she had this big event and sold out of all of her books in, in Highlands, that they need to get her and Pat Conroy together. And hearing her say that, I, I, I like she that wasn't out. <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even hear that I didn't even know that she had heard this conversation. And I was like, oh, well, that's good. Yeah. No. Well, there he hangs out up there, so we'll see. But he's also a very dear friend of Natalie's. Yes. I'll call her. You won't. I'll call no, no, her. No, no, no. Well, y'all may not have that backstory, but Pat Conroy wrote a cookbook a couple years ago, which is really amazing. Um, I mean, thank God I don't have some of his memories, but uh, anyway, you know, he is, it's just an amazing book, as all of his are. But I think it's like in the first, <coughs> excuse me, in the first chapter, he actually refers to Natalie Dupree, which if any of y'all know her, he refers to her as the most person-like a fictional character he's ever met. <laughs> you called me and read that to me on the I phone. I actually don't think that they've spoken. She hasn't spoken to him. No, really? Yes. But my response to that was when they told me that was that um, she's just working it. She's just working it. She loves, she loves it as long as the day is long. So, all right, so this is my... This Any... Any ink is good ink. So this is, uh, this is my uh, introduction. Rich in folklore and history, the cooking of the American South embodies all the glamour, grit, and heartbreak of Southern culture. The sad cruelty of slavery's influence, the joie de vie of wealthy, well-bred, landed aristocracy, the romance of moonlight and magnolia, 
the sun-washed wholesomeness of family memories, a note or two of twisted Southern Gothic, fierce attachment to the land, and recently, a prideful sense of place, with chefs boldly championing local, artisanal, and heirloom products and vegetables. My part in the old complex story of Southern food began in my grandmother's country kitchen with its walls made of heart of Georgia pine. My maternal grandmother, Emily Louise Wingate Baston, whom I called Mimi, was the daughter of a farmer, a true Southern lady, and a wonderful cook. Born in 1907, she grew up near Hepzibah, Georgia, from the time I was in a high chair to when I was a grown woman pulling up a chair to her kitchen table I love to hear her stories of milking cows and making butter and cheese, filling a root cellar, killing hogs in the fall, and curing hams in the smokehouse. Mimi graduated from Young Harris College in 1927, a somewhat unusual feat for a woman of her time in the rural South. Her diploma, a real sheepskin, real sheepskin has hung in the dining room of our family home for as long as I can remember. She met my grandfather at Fish Fry on the Savannah River. They were married for almost 65 years until he passed away. Mimi was the president of the Evans Extension Homemakers Club and was famous for pound cake, fried chicken, light buttery yeast rolls, old-fashioned butter beans, turnip and mustard greens with salty, smoky pot liquor and homemade jams and jellies. Many of these recipes are still scribbled in her handwriting directly on the wooden interior of her kitchen cupboard, a sight that can leave me breathless and even move me to tears. My mother, Virginia, and her siblings grew up being fed from that same heart of pine kitchen that came to mean so much to me. The family raised chickens and cows, but they stopped milking the cows and one surly beast kicked my grandmother. They packed the freezer with beef instead. <laughs> Mimi served grits every morning for breakfast, and Mama said she filled the plates to the rim. The school bus would pull up at the end of the long driveway, and my grandmother would make it wait until all the plates were clean. <laughs> no one, including the Columbia County Board of Education, argued with Mimi. In the 1960s, Mama and Mimi both watched Julia Child's first television series and religiously tried the recipes the following week. Years later, I was the grade school child who took leftover crepes au champignon and roulade au poulet to school for lunch. I hated it then. But now see in my mother's exploration the roots of my own passion for food. When I was three years old, my family moved to Louisiana, and Mama discovered Cajun recipes, often preparing red beans and rice, crawfish étouffée, and shrimp creole. So Mama's recipe covers Mama's repertoire covers all the Southern classics that she learned from Mimi, but also quail and red wine sauce, various gumbos, and French butter cookies. A love of fresh home cooked food and a tradition of unconditional hospitality have always been guiding values in my family. I see them as a testimony to our Southern heritage. I spent much of my childhood in the kitchen with Mimi and Mama, absorbing those values and acquiring skills I would later develop into a profession. There are photos of me, as young as four, in Mimi's kitchen, standing on a chair making biscuits, or sitting on the counter with my feet in the cool steel sink, shelling butter beans. From the age of 10, I used to sell birthday cakes to the neighborhood moms for their children. I often say I wish my entrepreneurial skills had continued at that same pace. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay, I think that. My career began in earnest in Atlanta, where I worked as an unpaid apprentice for Natalie Dupree and has since taken me all over the world. I've cooked for President Clinton, Chef Roger Verger, Aretha Franklin, Jane Fonda, and made Lapin Normandie with the Grand Dame, Julia herself. My television work has taken me from the steep cliffs of Amalfi, where I picked plump yellow lemons, to the coast of Connecticut, 
for I tasted a briny oyster straight from the frigid waters of the Atlantic. As a southerner and a graduate of both l'Académie de Cuisine and École de Cuisine La Varenne, my own style of cooking combines my southern heritage with classical French training. The result is a melange of new southern and new American cooking with a heavy dose of classic French technique. As a food writer and cooking teacher, I try to be sensitive to busy lives, hectic schedules, and health concerns. Thus, many of the recipes in this book were adaptations of and use less fat than traditional southern and classic French dishes. While a few are old-time dishes flavored with hog dowel and bacon, and some are just simple country food that would be equally at home both here and in France. My philosophy with most recipes is that simple is best. I try to use the finest ingredients, and by concentrating on sound French technique, do as little to them as possible to let the flavor of the actual food shine through, a style I like to call refined southern cuisine. These are recipes to cook in the home kitchen, not restaurant-driven creations. They are recipes for families, for displaced southerners yearning for a taste of home, for aspiring cooks, and for anyone who simply wants to spend some time in the kitchen working and playing with food. Some of my favorite memories, stories you will read in this book, happened in the kitchen learning at Mimi or Mama's side. I was learning so much more than food and cooking. Those times were history lessons, math exercises, and instruction in social studies. Food and cooking are always about so much more than just sustenance, of course. For me, they define some of my most precious relationships, root me in my culture, and give me my place in the world. Bon appetit, y'all, is my way of saying, welcome to my southern kitchen. Pull up a chair. Thank you so much.